let me refresh your memory. Um, it's an attempt to show that consciousness is non-physical. Um, that it's more than just not identical with some neural state, but it's also non-physical. So before Chalmers concocted the zombie argument, there were arguments that purported to show that consciousness is not identical with some neural state. And these arguments come from Tom Nagel, from Saul Kripke. We've got, we went over them earlier in the semester. Um, they basically involve the basic way of doing that was to, um, as you recall, start with a consequence of identity. One is that if x and y are identical, then they share all their properties. So mind can't share all its properties with brain, according to Tom Nagel, because mind has, requires a first person perspective, which um, you can't get from a third person perspective when you describe things from a third person objective point of view. So it's the difference between subjective and objective. Um, and since they don't share all their properties, they're not identical. Um, Kripke said a consequence of this, which we, I derived in class, is that if two things are identical, then necessarily they're identical. And then he showed an example in which it's not necessary that mind and brain states, pain, in, in the particular case he used a pain state and a brain state, uh, are identical. So if this is false, then by modus tollens, this is false. But just showing that x is not identical with y doesn't show, just showing that a mind, mental state, is not identical with a brain state doesn't show that a mental state is non-physical. Because if a mental state is not identical with a brain state, it's still there are certain, lots of options, namely that a mental state supervenes on a brain state, a mental state is non-physical and supervenes on a physical brain state, a mental state is physical and supervenes on a physical brain state, and several other possibilities. So neither Nagel nor Kripke with the kind of argument that they used back in the 70s, the early 70s, could show that mental states are non-physical. Chalmers tried to do that, but he had to do something more than just involve, um, just use uh, some conditions on identity. He had to bring in a notion of physicalism and we'll see, he had to make the definition of physicalism involve some kind of modal operator, modal notion, necessity. So we'll see how that looks. So if you're a physicalist, you think everything can be described in terms of a physical vocabulary, the vocabulary of basic physics, fundamental physics. So you think that there are um, that there's a fundamental ontology set of objects processes events and it's complete and it's true. So you think there is a complete, fundamental, true description of the world in terms of, you know, the basic items that you get in physics. And given this basis, everything in our world, every truth about our world should follow from it. So for all truths, about our world, 
Each one should follow from this. <coughs> now, this still doesn't involve any modal notion. It doesn't involve necessity. So, the idea that Chalmers had, and we'll see why you need necessity, but the idea that Chalmers and Frank Jackson had was that this is necessary. Um, so for all truths, it's necessary that any particular truth follows from the fundamental world description, the complete fundamental true world description. Now, why do you need this? This, by the way, that, that means necessity. Um, since, you know, I'm going to use, well, that's just a rather way of writing necessity. So for all truths about the world, it's necessary. But now what does necessary mean? Necessary is a strong idea. Necessity is a strong idea. It means, imagine right now that it's not sunny out. That's a way our world could be, but is not. The actual world is one in which it's sunny right now. But you can imagine a different world from ours, from the actual world, in which it's not sunny. So we imagine these sorts of, you know, um, deviations from the actual world. Um, and it's not, you know, we don't contradict ourselves in imagining such things, right? I don't contradict myself in imagining that it's not sunny out. So call an alternative to the actual world that we imagine a possible world. So when you say a statement is necessary, when you say the statement A is necessary, you're saying it's true in all the possible worlds you can imagine. And that's very strong. So that the sun is shining is not necessarily, not necessarily true. It's a contingent statement, because we can easily imagine worlds in which it's not <coughs> sunny right now. So this is a strong statement. It says, no matter what way the world is, each truth will follow from the fundamental world description. That's a very strong statement. And what Jackson and Chalmers say is that this is a necessary condition for the truth of physicalism. Meaning, if this is false, physicalism is false. You need this to be true on the way in which they define physicalism for physicalism to be true. So if you show this is false, physicalism is false. Now, if you are a physicalist, you think every truth, including truths about what is going on in your head, your subjective experiences. So right now, you're enjoying that coffee, and you're having the subjective experience of that great coffee taste. Call that Q. Call that experience you are having Q. If this is true, then Q follows from the fundamental world description. And what that means is in every world, no matter, you know, no matter what way you take the world to be, Q will follow from that fundamental world description. Now what's a zombie? A zombie is where you have the fundamental world description, but you don't have the phenomenal experiences. You have not Q. So you have the fundamental world description and not Q. 
That's a zombie. A zombie is where you have the physical world, but you don't have the phenomenal experience. So that's imagining your exact physical duplicate, which this takes care of, without consciousness, without phenomenal experiences. So this is a zombie. And now, how does this show that this is false? Well, since this is necessarily true, then in every world whatsoever, every possible world, including the actual world, this should be true for each truth. Well, Q is a truth. Right? A phenomenal experience. You're happy. That's a truth about our world. You are having that phenomenal experience right now. So, if you imagine a world in which you have your exact physical duplicate described by the fundamental world description, but it doesn't have phenomenal experiences. It does not have Q. That's a zombie. And let's look at this statement. First, we'll instantiate it with Q. Okay? So remember, this says for all truths, necessarily. Each one of them follows from a fundamental world description. So that's a universal quantifier. Let's do universal instantiation. And we will instantiate it to Q, which gives us this. OK. Now, necessity operator is also like a universal quantifier. It's saying, in all worlds. And so, for every world you enumerate, this should be true, if this is true. Remember that Q is your coffee experience. It's, your coffee's gone. Did you finish that? Oh, oh no, still some. <laughs> okay, so a point to make. The actual world is not a world in which you could have a zombie. Why? Remember what a zombie is, your exact physical duplicate. If there were some duplicate of you in this world, it could not be exact because the atoms would be different. Even though you each had the same number of potassium atoms, they wouldn't be the same potassium atoms. Because you'd have your potassium atoms, and your duplicate would have different potassium atoms, and thus you would not be an exact physical duplicate. And this matters for zombies, because it could be, probably, probably it's not true, but it could be that the exact potassium atom has something to do with the presence of consciousness. So the, Thinking of your exact physical duplicate in the actual world would be worthless because it wouldn't be an exact physical duplicate and you wouldn't know whether the differences, the physical differences could be attributed to, that the, that the physical differences would be responsible for the presence or absence of consciousness. So that's why it has to be in a different world than the actual world. Some possible world. <coughs> so in some possible world, this is so, if you can imagine a zombie. So since this, if this is true, then this, then this is true in each possible world. So let's look at world, we'll call it world B. OK? We'll look at world B. And we'll see whether. That conditional is true in world B. 
And let's work, let world B be the world in which we imagine the zombie to be so. So that's a world in which this is true and this is true. Well, if this is true and not Q is true, then this conditional is false. Because remember, the truth conditions for a conditional. If the left-hand side is true and the right-hand side is false, the conditional is false. So if you imagine a zombie in world B, you imagine that the fundamental world description is true and Q is false. And so this would show this is false in world B, and doing that would show that necessarily Q follows from the fundamental world description is false. And since this is an instantiation of this, it would show that this is false. And since this is a necessary condition for the truth of physicalism, it would show physicalism is false. So that's how the zombie works. That's what it does. It shows that a necessary condition for the truth of physicalism is false. So if you're unhappy with this argument because you don't think consciousness is not physical, then you could question this as a necessary condition for the truth of physicalism. And remember that necessity in there is pretty strong. And the reason why you need necessity is because you can't imagine a me meaningfully, that's to say, you can't imagine um, in the actual world your own zombie in a way that would show that physicalism is false. You have, need an alternative world to the actual world. So, and you don't know which one it's going to be, so you just have to say necessarily meaning in all worlds. <coughs> this is so. But that's a strong statement. <clears throat> it means in every possible world, you've got where you have the <clears throat> fundamental world description, the truths in the actual world have to follow from it. That's really strong. But let's not worry about that. So that's how the zombie works. If you can imagine a zombie, you can show that this necessary condition for the truth of physicalism is false. So let's look at some problems. People have criticized Stroma's argument. Um, a member of our very department is well known. She's a world famous philosopher, Kati Balog. Um, and she has an argument against zombies. Um, I've got different arguments. Um, so if you want to read her argument, uh, it was a paper that appeared in the Philosophical Review in the 1990s. Um, but um, I've got different arguments. So four of them OK. So I'll run through all four, if you can stand it. Um, the first one is <coughs> the zombie argument begs the question. Remember what you're asked to do. You are asked to imagine a world in which you have your exact physical duplicate. So it's got to be your exact physical duplicate. And your exact physical duplicate will have all of the necessary essential properties that you have. Where they're physical properties. And now here's the question. Is phenomenal consciousness a necessary, an essential property of you? 
If it is an essential property of you, then it's impossible to imagine a zombie. Because you would have to imagine whatever you imagine as having phenomenal consciousness. On the other hand, if it's not an essential property of you, then you can imagine it. Like, it's not essential that I have an arm. It's not an essential property of me or of anyone. So you can easily imagine a possible world in which you imagine yourself without an arm. And by yourself, I mean something that has all your essential properties. If it doesn't have all your essential properties, it's not you. Right? If you, whatever your essential properties are, take it to be your DNA. If you imagine somebody in another world that doesn't have your DNA, then you are not imagining you. So, in imagining your physical duplicate, you have to imagine that it has all the essential physical properties you have, whatever they happen to be. Actually, and it also has to have, you know, all your physical properties. But it certainly has to have your essential physical properties. And now the question is, is consciousness an essential physical property of you? If it is, you can't imagine a zombie. If it isn't, you can imagine a zombie. But notice, this is equivalent to the question of whether you can imagine a zombie or not. So, whether you can or you can't imagine a zombie depends upon whether or not consciousness is or is not a, an essential physical property of you. If it is an essential physical property of you, you can't imagine a zombie. And in fact, it would be senseless to do it because consciousness would have to be a physical thing. If it's not a physical thing, you can imagine a zombie. So whether you can or can't imagine a zombie depends upon whether consciousness is or is not a physical thing. But that's what the zombie argument was supposed to show, that it's not a physical thing. So you, if you have to already know before you can get the argument off the ground that consciousness is or is not a physical thing, then the argument is circular, begs the question. The question is, is consciousness physical or not physical? The zombie argument is supposed to answer that. The answer is supposed to be, it is not physical. But if you have to know before you can get the argument to work, whether it is or is not physical, whether <coughs> consciousness is or is not physical, the argument's gone. Um, so that's the begging question. Um, somebody could say, look, all you have to do is stipulate <coughs> what's going to be in this possible world. But that's not going to be the answer because that's not, that doesn't settle the issue because remember, what it is you are imagining in this possible world has to be your exact physical duplicate. So it's got to have your essential properties. So you just can't stipulate, it's got to have my essential properties. You just can't say, I stipulate that it has the essential properties. End of the story. You just can't say that. That, that would be a way of solving the problem by stipulation. I declare consciousness is non-physical. I stipulate it's non-physical. That doesn't do it, you know, that doesn't, uh, unless you're a king, you know, or whatever. Um, okay. Now, there's another kind of semantics for possible worlds. For, uh, for sorry, there's, a, there's another kind of semantics for understanding uh, the truth conditions for Necessity, and this goes. This is an idea that a philosopher now deceased, David Lewis, had, and he said, rather than imagining possible worlds, let's imagine counterparts to the actual world 
in which the things that are counterparts are different, but not substantially different from the things in the actual world. Um, maybe you think you could get away with having a counterpart who doesn't have all of your exact, your, your, doesn't share all of your essential properties. It's your counterpart, but it's not you. So it needn't necessarily have all of your essential properties. Um, the bad thing is that, I mean, we won't go into this, but the bad thing is that on the semantics, you can show semantics, this and this are false. This is a fundamental truth about universal instantiation. If everything is such that, if everything has F, then it has F. <coughs> it's a trivial truth. And it fails in counterpart semantics. And so does this. And you need both of these to get the zombie argument to run. You need this because you need to do a universal instantiation. Um, <coughs> We're not going to see why you need this, but you need to be able to distribute the necessity operator across a conditional. So if you lose both of them, um, you're not going to be able to run the zombie argument. It'd be interesting to see. I don't know. You know, somebody might who's really technically good might be able to figure out a way of making counterpart semantics such that you can actually run a zombie argument. I don't know if anyone's even tried that. I don't know if anyone's even seen the problem. Um, but Saul Kripke discovered this in 1969 and in a letter that was never published to David Lewis pointed out that both of these are false in invalid in counterpart semantics. Okay, so that's the first objection to the zombie argument called it's begging the question. The next one is the no cloning argument. And this comes from physics. About, I think it's in the 1982, um, people who work in quantum mechanics came up with what's called a no cloning theorem. That's to say, you can't clone yourself in the actual world. Why? Because if you did, you would have information about quantum states that would allow you to violate quantum mechanics. So you know some of the obvious things. If you know the position of a particle described at the quantum level, you can't know its momentum. But if you could, establish, if you could create a clone, then you'd be able to create a clone of yourself that had the information. And that would be a violation of the no cloning theorem. Well, what's this got to do with zombies? Suppose this is your worry. It could be that consciousness is an emergent physical property. It emerges <coughs> from a certain complexity of physical things. And the worry is that in imagining your exact physical duplicate, <coughs> maybe <coughs> you have consciousness. It emerges from the exact physical duplicate. So to show, to show that, to, answer, to, to respond to this worry, Imagine building your exact physical duplicate in another possible world, atom by atom. So that at some point you would see whether, you know, consciousness arises. Who knows how, how you could see this, but um, at any rate, if that is a problem you want to address, the emergence of consciousness from a complex system of physical matter, the way to address it would be to imagine 
the construction of your exact physical duplicate in another possible world step by step, atom by atom, to make sure that at no stage does consciousness emerge. The problem is you can't do this. You cannot create your exact physical duplicate by the no-cloning theorem. And the reason why is that you would have information that you're not allowed to have. When you create yourself atom by atom, you have to know the value in the actual world of the position and momentum of a particle in your body. In order to give it that value in the possible world, but you're not allowed to have that information. So you couldn't do it. You couldn't build, you couldn't imagine building yourself atom by atom. It's impossible because it violates the law of physics. <coughs> So, now, when I gave this as a talk a couple of years ago to the Rutgers Philosophy Club, Professor Balog was here, in, at the, and she made an interesting response. She said, um, Although this shows that it's not epistemically possible for there to be zombies, it doesn't show that zombies are not metaphysically possible. So remember, epistemic possibility is possibility with respect to what you know. But metaphysical proper possibilities possi is possibility with respect to the way things are, the nature of things. Um, so her objection is, you've described a situation in which it's not epistemically possible to imagine zombies, but that doesn't show that they're not metaphysically possible. It doesn't show that there isn't something in the world in which there are zombies. So, how am I going to answer that? Well. I contend that the no cloning theorems describe what is metaphysically possible. Um, and they also show that in each possible world, an exact physical duplicate of myself can be constructed. Um, the no cloning theorem is a restriction on what we can do, but it's also a restriction on the nature of things, the way things are. However things are at the quantum level, it's impossible for us to know both the position and momentum of a particle at the same time. So that describes the way things are, and the way things are is such that it's a restriction on what we can know as well. So it does describe a metaphysical possibility. And in this case, the metaphysical possibility that it describes rules out the existence of zombies. Even though it sounds like it's a metaphysical possibility and only a metaphysical possibility, it's both. It's in epistemically impossible for us to imagine zombies, and it's metaphysically impossible for us. So, the no cloning theorem, these theorems in quantum mechanics, these restrictions in quantum mechanics, are restrictions at both the metaphysical level and the epistemic level. They show the nature of physical reality and how that physical reality makes it impossible for us to know certain things. 
So they restrict what's epistemically possible for us. Okay. Well, there's a lot more actually to say about this. But we won't, uh, we won't do that. We'll look at the third argument. This is an argument where you'll get a, it's a cutesy argument using logic. Um, <coughs> what it has to do with the interface, if consciousness is non-physical, then shouldn't there be some interface where the physical and the non-physical meet? I mean, otherwise you have a big problem. If the physical and the non-physical <coughs> never meet, then consciousness is, remember the problem with epiphenomenal consciousness? Doesn't do any work. Because it has no interaction with the physical world. And this was the problem for Descartes, where the, he, he was a dualist. He thought that mental things or sub, mental substances are non-physical. There were physical substances and mental substances. But they, heck, they got to interact. So where do they interact? How does that take, what does it take place? He thought they, Descartes thought in the pineal gland, you know, the interaction occurred. Um, but let's look at the logic of the interaction. I think that it would be a very strange where the physical and non-physical interact. It's going to be a very strange place, the interface. <coughs> and so I suspect the following <coughs> is true at the interface, that it's possible M means possible, it's possible that it's not the case that for all propositions A, I'm not going to use variables, so this is a little bit of a uh, simplification. So it's possible that it's not the case that for every proposition, it's either true or false. In other words, in the interface, there are going to be propositions about the interface that we will never know. We just can't say whether they're true or false. Because it's so strange that we just don't have the, 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 the range of concepts. This is like a mysterious argument. We don't have the range of concepts to describe properly what goes on in the interface. It might even be stranger, it might even be metaphysically impossible to know whether a proposition is true or false. Okay, so if that's the case, then <coughs> let's do something with this. Okay, so let's de Morgan this thing, right, to give us that. And now you know that if you've got this, not everything <coughs> not, that's equivalent to an existence claim. That's quantifier negation. So this follows validly from this. That it's just a little tricky thing. If it's possible that it's not the case that each proposition is either determinately true or false, then it's possible there is some proposition A such that A and not A are both true. OK, this is just a tricky thing. Let's, now let's move, let's see what we can do. Now we know that necessarily, for all propositions, 
A follows from A. And that's just the tautology. And now let's fool around with this. A follows from A is equivalent to not A or A by implication. And now we can De Morgan this thing. And we can flip this around. And then we can also, if necessarily it's not the case, that's equivalent to it's not possible. So notice, starting from 4, we were able to derive it's not possible that there's some A such that A and not A. <coughs> but we also have 3, which is it's possible that there is some A, A and not A. And now let's conjoin 3 and 8. conjunction. And now since we're, there's something in modal logic, if I have a theorem, and this is a theorem, it follows from preceding lines in this proof, then it's necessarily true. And this is called necessitation. And now out of this, I can get the following. <coughs> Make sure I got the right one. <coughs> yeah. My existential generalization on nine. And now, I can fool around with this. possibility substitution. So notice I went from this. It's possible that it's not the case that for all propositions A or not A to it's not possible that for all A, A or not A. And this is a statement in what's called anti-realism the view that you can't take a realistic view toward you know, the objects of your concern, philosophical concern. That's a statement of anti-realism. So basically what it means is that if you accept one and all this trickery, then you have to be an anti-realist about the interface 
between consciousness and the physical, your physical being. You can't be a realist. You can't be, you can't say these things are really there. So however you cash out anti-realism in terms of what it allows you to say, the one thing it can't allow you to say is that they're really out there. So you have to be an anti-realist about the interface, which is strange. Okay. Anyway, this is trickery. So I don't know whether what you think about that. Now for the fourth <coughs> argument. The fourth argument involves something very, very few people know about. It's something so strange and so incredible that if you hear it, you won't believe it. In 1953, in 1952, a very widely respected mathematician from UCAL Berkeley, David <coughs> published a short paper called An Indeterminate Problem in Classical Mechanics. And what he showed is that the Newtonian equations of motion allow indeterminacies of the following kind. You can imagine a ball rolling down an inclined plane, an inclined ramp, and then, at some point, it strikes another ball at the end of, you know, a flat ground. So this rolls down and then strikes this ball. And this imparts momentum to this ball. And all of this can be described by Newtonian mechanics, the equa you know, Newtonian equations. And you would think, given the mass of this ball and its momentum, that there's just one value that this can have. Its momentum can have just one value. And what da Gale, David Gale showed is that this can have two values, and there's no way of saying, based on the equations of motion, which one it will have. This is an indeterminacy. Now, don't confuse this with chaos. It has nothing to do with chaos. Chaos is where you have a slight variation in a set of initial conditions that makes for huge differences in the end results. Here, fix the initial condition, whatever it happens to be, the mass of this thing and the force that you use to push it down the ramp, Fix it to an infinite number of decimal places if you want to. So that there's no difference in the set of initial conditions. There's just one set of initial conditions. And yet, according to David Gale, there'll be two different values for the momentum of this. This is very strange. I first heard about it from Saul Kripke years ago who was thinking about it, but not in this context. And I went on to use it in my book that I never ever emailed to you. If you want it, I'll email it to you. Um, not that it's a really fun thing to read on a hot summer day. But, um, at any rate, I used it in the book. And then I figured out a couple of years ago how you can use this to argue against zombies. And here it is. So remember, <coughs> this is a necessary condition for the truth of physicalism. And so this will be true in each possible world. And so let's instantiate that to Q, 
So this should be true in some possible world, but if you can imagine a zombie, then this is false. But now, let's use Gale's theorem. Let's describe what goes on in the brain at the level of Newtonian mechanics. You know, things hitting one another, neurons, um, whatever. Um, and here's the supposition we make. In certain Newtonian react, uh, um, um, phenomena in the brain, the end result is either a phenomenal conscious state or some non-phenomenal physical state of the brain. Okay? So you've got these Newtonian you know, phenomena going on in the brain, and the end result is either a state of phenomenal consciousness or some non-phenomenal physical state of the brain. And if so, then this is a truth about the actual world, and it should follow from the fundamental world description. Now I'm going to make a strong claim. I say this will happen for every, if consciousness is some result of physical phenomena in the brain, then this is a possibility for every phenomenal experience you have. And now let's see the problem that this hack provides for the zombie. So this will be true, this must be true in every possible world. So let's imagine a world where there's a zombie. That will not show this is false. Because the right hand side of the conditional is a disjunction. So if I have the fundamental world description and not Q, I don't show that this is false. There's only one way to show this is false. I have to have three things. I have to have this, and this, and not P. So if I have not Q and not P, then I show that's false. Then I show that this is false. And then I show that this is false. But now here's the problem. If I imagine a world where I have these three things, I don't have a zombie. Because this is a physical part of me. So if I imagine a world where I don't have it, I have not imagined a world in which there is my exact physical duplicate. Thus, to show this is false, I have to imagine a world where I don't have an exact physical duplicate. So I haven't imagined a zombie. So this is a big problem. And it's a simple matter of accepting this disjunction. Now, I claim it is an empirical matter whether for any phenomenal conscious state that the Gale finding, David Gale finding, shows that you could either have a phenomenal conscious state or a non-phenomenal physical state. That's the assumption I make. But the problem it poses for Chalmers is very deep. First of all, it shows it's impossible. If you can rewrite every truth about phenomenal experiences in the form of a disjunction, then it's impossible to imagine zombies. So it's impossible to show that this is false. 
So what will Chalmers have to do? Chalmers would have to show that this is false, not just in the actual world, but in every possible world. So he would have to show the following. To address my objection, Charles would have to show that necessarily it's not the case that CFTW implies Q P. He'd have to show this is true. So this is true in every possible world. Now, so let's see what he would have to do. Let's look at what this is. If this is not the case, then when this is true, this is false. So we have to show the following in every possible world. Then you have this, and this, and this. <coughs> to show that this is true in each possible world, we then show that necessarily it's true. And showing that this is so would show that I have to reject this, and you would then reject my objection. But he's got to show this is so. So if it's not the case that this is true, then that's true, that's false, and that's false. Right? But now look what he has to do. He has to imagine in every possible world <coughs> something which is not my exact physical duplicate. Because it doesn't have P. So in order to answer my objection, he's got to show that in each possible world, I do not have an exact physical duplicate. So he's, he's, it's got him. So this gets him because this shows there can't be. You can't show this is false. But he wants to show this will never happen. In each possible world, this will never happen. And to do that, to show it will never happen, he's got to show this is true. And to show this is true, in each possible world, these three things have to be true. So in each possible world, I can't have an exact physical duplicate. So it makes a big problem for the guy. So let's see. Okay, um, let me just show you a couple of things that you can get out of this with simple logic that you learned from me, those of you who took logic with me. How many people, let's see, how many people took it with me? Yeah. How many people have taken logic here? Not with me, though. Right. Oh, that's a good Probably. <coughs> okay. You took it with me. Yeah. That was when, like, that, that was the, uh, to bad, uh, Sandy, Sandy yeah. Hurricane Sandy. Um, so, um, So let's see um, a couple of things. Okay. Okay, let's fool around with this.
So first we'll just switch the order of P and Q. Now, we'll export P over to here. something better first, Tobot. Before we export, let's change this. So let's just do implication to change the wedge into a horseshoe. Now we'll export Okay, now remember what a zombie is. So you have, and not Q, but zombie. So let's simplify the not Q. And now we'll do modus tollens to get And now let's do more than that. So, starting with this fundamental conditional and the existence of a zombie, we can conclude that either physicalism is false or I have some physical state. I mean, you know, there's some physical state in my brain. So, we can run it the other way around as well. Okay, if we take these two things to be true, if you know that's what Chalmers wants to show that that thing's false. Um, So, given this thing again, and what Chalmers wants to be the case, that you don't have P in order to reject this, um, then we can derive either physicalism is false or I'm having a phenomenal experience. Okay. Finally, let me show you something. Someone could complain that the following is true. Okay, remember that's what Chalmers deal, you know, starts with. And we can just do this for any overture of V. Okay. And now We can imp this, and then we can reassociate our
parentheses. So that's association. And then we have by implication on four. So notice whenever this is true, this is true for any P whatsoever. So someone could complain and say, that's just a logical trick that you can get this. Because you can do it by logic always for any arbitrary P. But the point is the following. Gale's theorem about Newtonian mechanics motivates this. So even though this can be derived from this, without any assumptions about what P is. We can't rule out this by saying that it's a trivial logical consequence of this. So if someone objects to what we did by saying this is a trivial logical consequence of this and thus not worth looking at, the response is, uh-uh, it's motivated by Gale's theorem. So I can say just what P is, and I don't have to derive it from this. Okay, one last thing. Professor Baylock was at the talk, as I said, and she would not let me rest with this. And so she objected she raised an important question. She said, distinguish causally necessary from constitutively necessary. Where Gale describes what's causally necessary, in each possible world, where the laws of physics hold, that would be the case. But why I think it has anything to do with the zombie argument, you want to look at cases where things are constitutively necessary, that is, they are necessary to the constitution of the thing in question, in this case, say, a zombie. Um, and how can we get constitutive necessity out of causal necessity? You can. One doesn't automatically follow from the other. Well. My answer is coming. <laughs> this is both the long version of the term. Okay, so here's, here's how we answer. To use Gale's theorem against zombie arguments, we would need to show that the indeterminacy is constitutively necessary for human consciousness and not just causally necessary. Okay. Okay. So, in any possible world, what Gale describes is causally necessary. You're always going to get that. But now what does it describe at the level of the brain, where you're describing the brain in terms of the Newtonian phenomena? Describes the causal interactions that are taking place that give rise to my mental states and physical states in my brain. So, some of these phenomena that these describe will be constitutive of me, which is to say they will constitute my particular mental states. If it's a phenomenal experience, then it will constitute it will describe what constitutes my mental state. Or physical, if it's purely a physical, non-phenomenal state, it will describe what constitutes my non 
phenomenal physical state, mental state. So that's all I need. Some of the phenomena will be constitutive of me, some won't. Whichever are constitutive of me, that answers the objection. Whichever ones are not constitutive of me, I don't worry about. All I need is that there must be some that are constitutive of me. That's to say, all of them will describe what's causally necessary. Some will describe what's constitutive of me, depending on what we take to be constitutive of me. And so on. So that's all I need to answer the objection. I say there will be some and there will be others. There will be some Newtonian phenomena constitutive of me, others that are not. And all I need to do is to say there are some. Now, if you argue that there might be Newtonian, there might be worlds in which the Newtonian laws break down, then I'm not interested in those worlds because there are worlds in which the laws of physics will be very different from our own. And so it would be senseless to talk about what happens to me in such worlds. The other thing is, I can get away with this because we don't know what's constitutively necessary for phenomenal consciousness. Right? We don't know. So I can simply say, whatever Newtonian phenomena are constitutively necessary, there must be some for phenomenal consciousness. But we, in fact, don't even know what they are because we don't know what's constitutively necessary for <coughs> consciousness. So to object that my use of Gale's theorem doesn't address the question of constitutively necessary would assume you already know what's constitutively necessary. In other words, to show that my use of Gale's theorem doesn't work, you would have to do the following. You have to show here is what is constitutively necessary for phenomenal consciousness, and Gale does not describe any such phenomena. So the burden of proof is on Professor Baylock's shoulders. She's got to show first what is <coughs> constitutively necessary for phenomenal consciousness, and secondly, that Gale's theorem doesn't describe that. But she hasn't done. She hasn't done that. Um, I mean, I don't think she can. Uh, she's super smart, but I don't think no one knows what's constitutively necessary for phenomenal consciousness. <coughs> but she's she's a first-rate, world-renowned philosopher. You should take a course with her if you haven't already before you graduate. Um, our department is a fantastic small department. Um, Professor Baylog is one of the best philosophers of mind in the world. Professor Ken Eisauer is probably one of the best people in philosophy of neuroscience in the world. He's <coughs> incredible. Professor DeRosa is one of the foremost historians, one of the leading world's experts on Descartes. And Professor Eden Lin, the new member of the department, is new to philosophy. He just got his PhD from Princeton last year, but he's going to make a big splash in the world of philosophy, looking at the issue of well-being, the moral issue of well-being. And me, <laughs> your friend who knows about logic. So that's it for today. Um,